Good evening. I'm Josh Schwartz. I direct McGill's Office for Science and Society, where we have a mandate to popularize science and to separate fact from myth. It's my honor tonight to once again join you for the second Goodman Cancer Institute public lecture series of the season. Today's speakers will be legendary researchers Dr. Phil Gold and Dr. Nicole Beauchemin, both well known for their far-reaching contributions to cancer research and as beloved teachers and mentors. It's truly an honor to host Dr. Beauchemin here with us today and have her share her research. Tonight is a tribute to her legacy and dedication as much as to her groundbreaking research. We'll also meet PhD student Matthew Dankner, who represents the next generation of scientists at the GCI, a researcher passionate about cancer treatments and bringing bench to the bedside. Now let's hear from our co-chairs, Paul Sislien from Bombardier Transport and Jonathan Durocher from Banque Nationale, and tonight's sponsor, Laurent Amram, president from CDL Labs and Elna Medical. Bonjour, je suis Jonathan Durocher, président de la financière Banque Nationale Gestion de patrimoine. Je vous remercie de vous joindre à nous pour cette conférence publique toute spéciale, lors de laquelle nous aurons l'occasion d'entendre deux des chercheurs les plus dévoués de l'histoire de l'ICG. La recherche et le mentorat mené par l'Institut ont inspiré de nombreux changements dans notre communauté locale et bien au-delà. Nous sommes très fiers de faire partie de ce mouvement. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Paul Sislian. I'm the Executive Vice President of Operations at Bombardier. The research we're going to learn about tonight has the potential to impact millions of lives. These GCI researchers, Dr. Philip Gold and Dr. Nicole Beauchemin, have dedicated their lives and their careers to bettering the community. And we are very proud to support their legacy and the future of cancer research. Thank you, Jim and John. It's our great honor to sponsor this evening's public lecture series and learn more about the legacy of Dr. Gold and Dr. Beauchemin. My companies, CDL Labs and Elna Medical, are managed with patient care at their core, and that's how we also feel about the important life-saving work being done at the GCI. Supporting this cause makes us very proud. I think cancer research at McGill without Phil Gold would not be what it is today. I mean, he's pretty much one of the first, you know, modern pioneers of cancer research at McGill with the discovery of CEA. And, and, and Nicole was part of that legacy. I think uh, Nicole was highly influenced by Phil Gold. Uh, I think Phil Gold was also influenced by, uh, by Nicole. I've known Nicole for a long, long time. Uh, she's probably one of the first people that I met when I started my own lab. Uh, back at McGill in those days. She's a very passionate person, uh, Nicole. I mean, she's very devoted. She's one of the most honest person that I know. Very smart, very intuitive. She sees things that other people don't see. Nicole isn't just a researcher. She's a passionate, passionate mentor. And she's trained and educated generations of cancer researchers who've come through the Goodman Cancer Institute. So over 45 years ago, uh, Phil Gold made one of the most significant discoveries in cancer research. And this was the discovery of a biomarker called CEA. And this biomarker is still used today in blood tests to diagnose and to make decisions of patients with cancer. Nicole had trained with Cliff Stanners, who was the director uh, of the Cancer Center at that time. He obviously saw her potential, so he recruited her as a young assistant professor. And uh, what Nicole did when she was a, a postdoctoral uh, fellow uh, with uh, Cliff Stanners uh, is that she cloned uh, the gene encoding CEA. And this was the beginning of understanding how CEA functioned in cancer and in normal uh, cells in our body. It became obvious that there were cousins of CEA, and one of the cousins was called CCAM1. Nicole uh, is the one who started that field with the CCAM1 and the role as a uh, molecule that suppresses the function of the immune system. So the idea is if you could block the function of CCAM1, uh, Nicole's uh, favorite molecule, uh, with an antibody, for example, you may enhance the function of the immune system and enhance the ability of the immune system to kill the cancer cells. The importance of the last 35 years of Nicole's work has 
believe it or not, come together in her semi-retirement. She now, she still works with researchers worldwide. And this has now identified that CEA is an immune checkpoint target. This we could never have predicted 35 years ago. And by an immune checkpoint target, what that means is it may be an, an, a new target for immunotherapies. And we're not finished yet. I think the important thing is to say we're, we're not finished. This is the time span that it takes to take a discovery all the way through to demonstrating a therapeutic target, new therapies in the clinic, and improved cancer outcomes. Her role over the years uh, sort of expanded from uh, being a scientist, a very successful scientist, a collaborator with people all over the world, and also uh, a mentor for young scientists, but also an advisor for the administrative uh, personnel uh, of the uh, center. So the center became at some point the Goodman Cancer Center, now it's an institute, and I think Nicole was there pretty much all along. So this legacy by Phil Gold and Nicole of the discovery and the understanding of the function of CEA is an example of world-class cancer research. And it really was the ground forming research that stimulated the formation of the McGill Cancer Center, now the Goodman Cancer Institute. But at the Goodman Cancer Institute, we've got many world-class researchers who have similar um, legacy stories and we have to recognize how inspiring this is for the next generation. Tonight is highlighting the legacy of both Nicole and Phil Gold. What they have built is pride. Pride in research, pride in the next generation and without Nicole what I can easily say is that many of us would not be as successful as we are today. Dr. Phil Gold is an inspirational educator and a groundbreaking scientist in cancer research. And as you're about to find out tonight, is credited with the discovery of carcinoembryonic antigen, known as CEA, the first clinically useful human tumor marker, and one that is found in 79% of cancer patients. He's also one of the most cited authors in scientific journals on cancer, has many prestigious awards to his name, has helped build the Goodman Cancer Institute and its community as well, and has raised extraordinary sums of money for the medical community. Welcome, Phil. Dr. Nicole Beauchemin has been a researcher and professor at the Goodman Cancer Institute for over 30 years. Her focus on finding a genetic signature for colorectal cancer is very promising research that will help identify individuals with genetic predisposition before it develops and keeps them one step ahead of cancer. Nicole herself is a breast cancer survivor, as well as a beloved educator whose legacy has touched the lives of countless students and researchers. Welcome, Nicole. Matthew Dankner is a PhD student at the Goodman Cancer Institute whose research is focused on metastatic brain tumors from other sites such as breast, lung, and skin. He hopes to one day become a clinician scientist involved in the care of cancer patients while also leading a translational research group because, in his words, having the potential to impact the lives of patients through our research is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Jill, for the introduction. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased that you can join us tonight on the public lecture series on carcinoembryonic antigen and its descendants. My name is Nicole Beauchemin. I'm a researcher at the Goodman Cancer Institute, and I'm joined tonight to talk about our favorite molecules by Dr. Phil Gold, who has been doing this for the last 60 years, and by Mantu Dankner, an MD-PhD student with whom we've had the pleasure of working on this project. Um, Phil, you've been working on this for 60 years. How did you fall into this? Am I that old? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, my first contact uh, with uh, McGill University was in the Department of Physiology, where I was in honors physiology with three other students. 
and a remarkable cadre of mentors who taught us all about the normal function of tissues and organs. Uh, all three of us, all four of us actually went on to medical school shortly thereafter and for the next four years learned how all those normal things could go wrong and effectively um, we would have to treat diseases to try and get things better. When I wound up on the uh, medical service at the Montreal General Hospital in 1962, uh, many of the patients there had uh, cancer and which I learned was a, a devastating disease not only to the patient but also to their families. They were being treated after they'd had their, their surgery for the tumor. They were now receiving chemotherapy with drugs and radiation therapy in order to, to, to kill some of the cells. Both chemotherapy and radiation therapy worked primarily on rapidly dividing cells, which were in fact, in fact cancerous, uh, more so than normal, but normal tissue did not escape. And the question that came to my mind, was there no more specific fashion in which we could actually deal with cancer? Was there no cancer molecule function marker, cancer marker that we could now attack from the point of view of more, better diagnosis, better processing the disease as it went forward, and more importantly, finally, but to serve as a target for the therapy of cancer. Uh, it had been said that this had been looked for, this marker, for over a hundred years. It hadn't been found. That was true. And then the sentence, nor would it ever be found. That was not a fact, that was a challenge, because never say never in biology. And it seemed to me that with the explosion in the information and knowledge in immunology at the time, which allowed for very sensitive and very specific approaches to biology, that that should be the approach taken to looking for this cancer marker. In order for that to work, uh, we would then be utilizing two technologies. And first, I must make a definition. An antigen is a foreign molecule in any body, in any animal or human body, which is looked at as not self something that requires an immune response. The most common one being an antibody, as we've learned from COVID-19, an antibody to an antigen, foreign antigen, antibody response. And so effectively, could we do this uh, in, uh, in animals? Because there's going to be so few, if any, tumor markers uh, in a normal cell, how could we do this? Looking for a needle in the haystack, first remove the haystack, done in two ways. First, the cancer. We had to be able to get tissue from the same individual, both cancerous and normal tissue. The only tumor that allows for that is bowel cancer, large bowel, colon, and rectal cancer. And our surgical colleagues and pathologists were very helpful in letting us do that. So we could actually do that, uh, compare one with the other and not with other individuals, because then the differences would be individual specific and not tumor specific. Since we were looking for a needle on the haystack, remove the haystack in two ways. It had been shown by a man by the name of Peter Medawar, now Sir Peter Medawar, or that time, Nobel laureate for this, for this finding, that if one exposed an animal to foreign tissue early in life, the animal would come to accept that as self. In other words, you could fool the immune system into believing that a foreign material was self. And so what we did there was that we exposed eight-hour-old rabbits at birth, immediately after birth, to the normal tissue components of the patients who, whose tumor had been removed. And then as adults, as you can see on the slide with the rabbits, as adults, they were then injected with the tumor tissue from the same patient. The question was this, would they now recognize the normal tissue as self? And if anything was different about the tumor, would they then react to that? So that was the first approach. The second was to immunize adult rabbits, as you see on the second part of the slide, with tumor initially, and let them react to everything, both the normal components and hopefully the tumor component of the cell. And then once we have the antibodies in the serum of the blood, add an excess of normal tissue to that serum to neutralize the anti-normal antibodies in the hope that only the anti-tumor antibody would remain. So you remove the haystack and you think you have an antibody that might recognize your cancer-specific protein. Correct. How did you test it? On a Friday afternoon, I loaded the plate, 
that we were going to test. I took it home where our eldest child couldn't get at it. And on Saturday morning... After wife, coffee? After, no way. My, my wife said, let's look. I said, no, no, no. Not till we have coffee. So it shouldn't be a total waste. And then we looked. And there was the white band indicating a material in the tumor cell absent from the normal cell. For the first time in my life, I knew something that no one else in the world knew. Which I'm, was? That there was a molecule in the tumor cell that made it specific for cancer. On Monday morning, I told anybody who would listen. <laughs> and you had a diagnostic test that you could now elicit on many different types of tumors and see whether the protein called carcinoembryonic antigen was present on these tumors. And we went on to try and define what the protein looked like. At the end of the day, that's the beauty of working in a university setting and like a place like the Goodman Cancer Institute where people go on from generation to generation. To generation to generation. So when I joined the team of Cliff Stanners and Abe Fuchs, uh, they had been looking to identify and uh, define exactly what this carcinoembryonic antigen uh, protein was going to be. And for this, we used techniques of molecular genetics and identified the um, messenger RNA that contained the um, encoded protein. Uh, it was defined as a very large protein in the very beginning, actually, which was quite surprising because uh, compared to most proteins uh, existing in the body, which are uh, medium sized, this one was a large one. Uh, it actually was anchored to the cell surface. It had a little uh, cy uh, cytoplasmic domain that uh, made it sort of wobbly at the cell surface. Uh, it had uh, seven areas quite clearly defined and to our great surprise, it was coated with sugars. 28 different uh, sugar residues were expressed on this molecule. So uh, basically uh, then the question was, okay, so what does it actually do? So when you want to look for a function of a molecule and you're not quite sure what it's going to be doing, you take a type of cell that normally doesn't express it and you put it in there. You express it on the cell surface. And the first thing we noticed when we did this experiment was that actually the, cell, the cells began sticking to each other, um, giving us an indication that possibly this was cell surface and maybe that this protein was actually connecting with itself at the cell surface and making the cells stick together. A uh, whole many different experiments were then um, uh, developed that actually showed that in fact they do uh, act as a zipper at the cell surface in such a way that the two molecules can connect to each other and connect the cells to each other. So these were cells that normally didn't express it and then you put it in there. The question is what happens when you're using the cells that actually do express it? So what we did find was that some tumor cells could actually connect with the tumor cells, but then some tumor cells could connect with immune cells. And then some of the protein that's expressed at the cell surface eventually gets cleaved off the cell surface and is expressed in the serum, thereby the radio assay that you can actually detect it. And basically uh, what was discovered many years by many different teams was that there is actually a receptor for the CEA that's floating around on some liver cells and that when the receptor and the ligand being CEA connect together, it gives a signal to the liver cells to start producing inflammatory cytokines. You've all heard about this through the, um, uh, the COVID response, which is a hyperinflammatory uh, situation. And when you have hyperinflammation, the whole body responds to this. And in the case of CEA, what happens is that it favors the development of metastasis in bowel cancer, but many other cancers where it actually is expressed. And this is a whole field of people. There's actually almost 40 groups of researchers throughout the world who've been working on this. We found it was not just one protein, that there was actually a whole family of proteins. In fact, we now know that there are 29 active genes, all clustered on human chromosome 19. 
And that in spite of the fact that they all pretty much looked alike, one was particularly different in that it um, was expressed all along the evolutionary chain, all the way down to the minor organisms. Um, it was also a cell surface, but this one was actually really sticking to the cell membrane and had inside the cell a cytoplasmic domain with very specific motifs that made it signal inside the cell and connect to the whole cell machinery. What happens in tumor cells? Matthew, you spent some time looking into this. Yes, uh, I did alongside, alongside yourself and Dr. Gold. And this is really an area of research that's been ongoing for, for around 30 years um, with groups here at McGill, as well as really all over the globe, uh, looking at the function of CCAM1 in various types of cancer. And the general consensus uh, is that, you know, normal tissues express low levels of CCAM1. And as you progress from a normal tissue to an early stage cancer, to an advanced cancer, and then to a metastatic cancer, the amount of CCAM1 found on the cancer cells goes exponentially upwards. Um, so this is really what solidified CCAM1 as a very useful uh, tumor biomarker. So a marker uh, for advanced stages of cancer. And this spans from all different types of cancer, melanoma and lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer and colon cancer, uh, all of which we study here at the GCI. Um, and also very importantly is that we found that tumors that have lots of the CCAM1 molecule uh, pretend a very bad prognosis for patients. So patients whose tumors have lots of CCAM1 don't live as long as patients, for whatever reason, whose tumors don't have lots of CCAM1. Matthew, you're, you just got in, involved in this kind of work recently. How old are you again? I'm 28. 28. This was already cloned and you were born. These number of genes were identified. But, you know, how did you get into this actually? And why is it interesting to you? So I became very interested in research during my undergraduate degree. Um, like lots of people, like Dr. Gold, I was interested in, in research. A little bit just because I wanted to get into medical school, but a little bit because it was just purely interesting, to be completely honest with the world. Um, but once I started doing it, I really fell in love with the science, uh, in particular cancer research, and being able to do things in the laboratory that could one day, quite, quite quickly actually, make their way to an actual human being and help improve their lives. And so that's something that, that really uh, struck with me and was, was super interesting from the beginning. Um, so you were able to identify that CCAM1 was expressed on many aggressive types of cancers, but that's not the whole story. It's also expressed on immune cells. And what does that mean? Yeah, that's absolutely right. It is expressed on really every single type of immune cell. So over the course of, of you know, my short time in cancer research, the entire immunotherapy revolution has started and is now ongoing. And what really this is, is when we realized, or scientists around the world started to realize that the power of our own immune systems and that we all have T cells inside of us, um, that when we have cancer, become tired, become exhausted, almost give up the fight against the cancer. And that they do this by having what are called immune checkpoints or, or like brakes for your car. Uh, and so we've developed new drugs called immunotherapies or immune checkpoint blockade that specifically target these brakes turning on our T cells to then go and battle the cancer. And so for many different types of cancer, this has led to huge gains and improving the lives of patients. Which we could have never thought would bloom in such a way so many years ago. Philosophically, we thought it would. But at that point in time, the movement was linear. Now it's exponential. Yes, so the acceleration of, of the science is now allowing us to do things we could only imagine 60 years ago. So we've seen all these wonderful developments in the last 60 years, uh, which were somewhat anticipated at the very beginning of it, but which have blossomed tremendously with young folks like Extreme. Matthew. You are also pretty young, my dear. But at the end of the day, it's been remarkable and wonderful to watch as this goes forward in, in, in a place where it began. And it's only, in, and we're only in many ways really only beginning again to take this forward. Yes, and it, in fact, it's been a worldwide collaboration with as many as 40 to 45 teams working on various aspects of this, which have all contributed to new uh, technologies, new research developments, but it's still coming and coming from McGill and the Goodman Cancer Institute. 
And so you have your work cut You're out for you. Joe. Yes. <laughs> oh. And now back to Dr. Joe. Thank you, Dr. Borshaman, Dr. Gold, and Matt. We have someone here with us who understands very well how these discoveries reach the private sector. Please welcome Stefan Larson. He's a member of the advisory board of the GCI who will tell us how he sees the research reaching the public. Thank you, Dr. Joe, and good evening, everyone. I'm Stefan Larson, and I lead the healthcare venture capital team at Sectoral Asset Management here in Montreal. I'm also proud to be a member of the advisory board here at the GCI. The fundamental discoveries you heard about today highlight the critical importance of funding and supporting basic cancer research. We need an intimate understanding of how tumors start and grow and evolve so that we can identify where they are most vulnerable to attack. This provides us with a starting point to develop safe and effective treatments to fight cancer. Cancer therapies of today would not exist without the groundbreaking discoveries that happened in the lab 10, 20, even 30 years ago. And the cancer therapies of tomorrow will not exist without supporting the hard work, ingenuity, and scientific curiosity of today's cancer researchers. Now let's move on to the Q&A portion of the evening and see what our viewers are wondering about this research. So we heard a fantastic uh, presentation and uh, we're going to get to your questions, but first uh, we're going to call on the call for a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before moving on to the questions you may have on this forum, we would like to take a few moments to share some very sad news with you. On Thursday, April 21st, our friend and colleague, Dr. Maxime Bouchard, a young researcher at the Goodman Cancer Institute, passed away peacefully of colorectal cancer. Maxime is survived by his partner, Dr. Suzanne Keitna, and his two sons, Daniel and Matthias. Dr. Maxime Bouchard was a world-renowned scientist. His work focused on fundamental mechanisms controlling tissue and organ development. The same mechanisms are also at play and drive cancer. He explored these fascinating parallels using the urogenital system as a model with novel discoveries on renal and prostate cancers. Dr. Bouchard discovered a gene network that controls stem cell fate decisions during normal development of the prostate gland. And he showed that genetic changes associated with prostate cancer perturb this network causing the prostate stem cell population to expand, while therapies targeting the expansion can prevent prostate cancer progression in preclinical models. His recent work, which was published a few months ago in the journal eLife, paves the way for new prostate cancer therapies designed to correct imbalances in cellular populations. In addition to the fantastic research Maxime also leaves behind a legacy with those he trained and mentored. Phil, Matthew, and I wish to dedicate this lecture in memory of Maxime Bouchard, our wonderful friend and colleague. He will be remembered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, nobody is spared from this scourge. Doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter uh, how much money you have, nobody's spared. And unfortunately, we witnessed that uh, this past week also with the passing of Mike Bossi and Guy Lafleur, both of them from cancer, from uh, lung cancer. And um, actually, uh, Nicole's uh, uh, tribute uh, can launch us into a question that, that was posed from someone who, who says that, uh, their aunt recently passed away from uh, uh, colon cancer after a two-year battle. And how is it that uh, she wasn't uh, uh, exposed to any of the novel therapies? Who gets the newest treatments and who does not? Who wants to handle that one? Phil. Phil. I would find it very difficult to believe that in Montreal at this moment in time, from any of the hospitals in the U of M or McGill, 
that, and that someone would not get the utmost possible therapy available. Um, the fact is, of course, that every cancer is different, even of the same organ. The metabolism is different. The biochemistry is different. And we don't always get the same effect from the things that we do. But at the end of the day, I, I would find it difficult to believe that she didn't get consummate care and consummate therapy. I'm sorry, Joe, I, can't, I just can't see that. Okay. Um, next question. As we know, it takes a long time for research to get to the, uh, to, uh, the clinic. Is it a question of funding? If there were uh, infinite money available for cancer research, would we be getting to the goal more quickly? Or is it the science that makes it so difficult? I think it's both. Um, for sure, having more money and more techno technology to help us uh, would speed, speed up the discoveries and speed up the experiments and give the opportunity to more uh, trainees to embark on these projects and help, and help in the translation with the clinic. Um, this being said, this project that we explained tonight has been 60 years in the making. And um, there are some discoveries that we have done in the last uh, three, four years that we could not have done easily uh, with a small number of people and the money that we had uh, 10, 15 years ago. And what is now uh, giving us the opportunity to look forward to translating this therapy to patients is a combination of dedication, uh, grants obtained, donor money to support us uh, in these developments, and wonderful teams of scientists all working towards the same goal. In the past couple of years, uh, because of COVID, we saw massive cooperation from scientists around the world in developing the, uh, the vaccines. Um, is there a parallel uh, collaboration uh, across the globe for cancer research? Yes. There's <laughs> a simple answer to that. Uh, cancer research internationally has been going on for decades. Um, sometimes uh, some of our colleagues in the U.S. who have uh, a great deal more money than we do, it used to be 10% from uh, for Canada to the U.S., now it's about 2.5% for Canada. But all that said, our international relationships and, and, and research uh, go back, as I say, many, many decades to Europe, to Japan, uh, in fact, to China as well, in many cases, uh, and there's no problem with that at all. So that it's not just a matter of, 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 of money. It's a matter of ideas and good interactions. And, and, and Joe, it's coming. It's coming. Now, one of the questions that we get repeatedly is, when will there be a cure for cancer? <laughs> Michael, you're, you're, you're young enough to, to talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I could speak to this point. Um, when will there be a cure for cancer is something we, we all get asked and everyone wants to know the answer to. Um, but I think it's a very nuanced question because we're, we've learned over the past uh, you know several years that the word cancer uh, actually means many, many different diseases. And to a certain extent, each individual cancer, and even each cell within a person's cancer uh, is an entirely different disease when we're talking about the spectrum of genetic mutations that they have, the metabolism that they have, uh, and various uh, responses to therapy that they may have. So it's very unlikely, but possible, but I think unlikely that there's a magic bullet that will cure all cancer uh, for the end of time. But we've made a lot of progress in the past several years and a lot of exciting things coming up in the next several years um, that will really start chipping away at a lot of these types of cancer that were previously very, very difficult to treat. Um, and we've made great strides in improving the treatments of them. And we're gonna, gonna con uh, continue down this path, hopefully towards one day, uh, chipping away at enough of these pieces to effectively say we've cured cancer. We are, we are, we are curing cancers and doing it already. For example, malignant melanoma, that was a very bad disease, very rapid, is now being treated by immunotherapy. And a very good friend of mine who came into my office one day and said, 
I'm going to die soon. I've come to say goodbye. I said, not so fast. He's now five years post-therapy with immunotherapy and doing very well, thank you. So we talk about a cure for, there's no more a cure for cancer than there is for infectious disease. There will be as many cures as there are cancers in different places in different times. But we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We will get there. Isn't uh, Jimmy Carter also a classic example of the malignant melanoma? And yes. he, was, he was cured of it? Absolutely right. Right answer. Yes. Uh, another question that we often get is, what about this epidemic of cancer? What is causing it? Is it the environment? Is it uh, you know, uh, just that people are living longer or, or whatever? First of all, is there an epidemic of cancer? I think we're much better at diagnosing cancer than we were 40 years ago. Uh, the fact that we live much longer, the fact that we are exposed to a bit of a stressful life, uh, the fact that uh, we uh, are not necessarily very diligent at uh, watching um, our diets, uh, exercising, um, you know, are, are, these are all very conducive to inflammate a state of inflammation, which favors the development of genetic events that will lead to cancer initiation and then eventually cancer progression. So it's a combination of reasons uh, why we notice it more, why we diagnose it more. Um, we do have some solutions, but even if you live the perfect life, exercise every day, uh, eat the best possible foods, uh, stay away from uh, too much alcohol or any other uh, stressful agents, um, you most, a certain fraction of the population would likely come down with cancer anyway, because in the good old days, people used to live to the grand old age of 60, and uh, it's no longer uh, just 60. Now we have some people living in uh, the 90s and the 100s. So um, we accumulate a whole bunch of genetic mutations as we go along, which change our makeup and our, uh, our genetic environment. And some of it is unfortunately conducive to development of cancer. Nobody gets out of life alive. Right. No, but true. And, and I think we've all seen one particular cause of cancer that's basically disappeared or no, disappearing from the environment, and that's cigarette smoking. Yes. Uh, we just lost one of our hockey heroes who was an avid smoker, as were the better part of the players that I saw at the hospital when they came in for their annual examinations. They don't smoke anymore. Indeed, our students don't smoke anymore. So I think we're doing a lot better that way. And hope there's always been an epidemic, Joe. There, there's always been talked about as an epidemic. It hasn't changed that much. Guy used to smoke in between periods. Mm. Yeah. I used to smoke on the wards, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to have a chemistry prof who would smoke during lectures. And when he was finished, he would stand the butts up on the lecture table and at the end of the class, there would be a whole row of cigarette butts standing. I think I know who that was. We won't talk about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, we have uh, questions that have been uh, uh, texted in or, or, or called in. Um, the protein that you talked about obviously is uh, diagnostic, but is it uh, anyhow involved with treatment? That was the whole idea. Matt, Nicole, why don't you take that on? So Matt, do you want to hit the car key cells? <laughs> sure, I could speak to this a little bit. Um, there are actually a few different different angles from which uh, therapies are being developed to target CEA and CCAM1. Um, one of them is a technology called CAR T cells, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And basically what this technology is, is they, uh, your doctor will you know, take a, a sample of blood, which contains some of your own T cells, which are uh, your body's immune cells that fight and are also involved in fighting cancer. And they're brought to the lab where they're then uh, made to overexpress what's called a chi chimeric antigen receptor um, that's essentially targeted against either whether it be CEA or CCAM1. 
Um, and then when these cells are then put back in your body, uh, it allows the cancer, these T cells to home in on the cancer and target it. Um, and these, these, these therapies, uh, CAR, -T, CAR T cells are being used widely in various types of cancer. And those specifically uh, using CEA and CCAM1 as targets are still in development, but are very promising. Um, and a second angle is what's called monoclonal antibody therapies, which are just essentially uh, antibodies that target a particular protein that you're interested in. And so in this case, uh, CEA and CCAM1 are two of these targets that are being taken through uh, very large, expensive clinical trials in the U.S. and all over the world. And C, or particularly CCAM1 is thought of as one of these immune checkpoint breaks um, where your T cells are, are basically like cars that are driving to fight your cancer and they have breaks on them. And CCAM1 has been shown to be one of these breaks. And so with an antibody that targets the breaks, the car then drives and can then kill the cancer. And so these are also drugs that are that are going through clinical trials and that we're all very excited about. Um, and we hope to, to see their, their hopeful success in the, in the next few years. Great. I'm, I'm getting the wrap it up signal here. But uh, one final question uh, to, to Phil and Nicole. Are you inspired by today's researchers, young ones like Matthew? And are they going to have an easier or a tougher time than you guys had? It, it's going to the lab in the morning is particularly exciting because of these young researchers that we're in contact. I think it keeps us young. It keeps us on our toes. Uh, we participate in their mentoring and their development, but we tag along on the research, the fantastic research that they do. And it's very inspiring to us. We'll, it be easier for them or not. Um, I think each um, era has had its difficulties and some of the difficulties that Phil and I went through uh, are now easily solved and never much of a problem. Uh, Matthew, for sure, um, heading for a, a MD-PhD uh, type of clinical research associated with basic research. Uh, he's, he's decided that he's going to do two careers and maybe three careers for all we know. And, and you know, uh, it's, he's the, this is the kind of guy he is. Will it be difficult? The funding is going to be an issue for sure. Uh, technology and development and, and uh, joining in large networks is now relatively easy, but the funding is going to be a stumbling block uh, if uh, things don't uh, change in the next uh, decade? Uh, hopefully the, the, the money will come both from government but also from private sources which yes. have always been critical to us. Well, thanks very much. And it's very inspirational to hear all of you and uh, to, to realize uh, the great work that is being done at the Goodman Cancer Institute and that um, it's not only interesting work but it's getting results. And as we know, Cancer research is a marathon. It's not a hundred yard uh, dash. Right on. But, but we're well along in that, in that marathon. So thanks very much for uh, giving us all of this information and doing it in such an understandable and entertaining fashion. And of course, thanks to all of you who have tuned in and uh, listened and uh, who will see you next time. Thanks everyone.